He was a man They say he was simple He took less Than a day At a time You could see In his eyes Just what he lived for Hey everybody, Trapper Dan here it's April 4th and we got some snow and it's pretty cold. It's like 32 degrees. And unfortunately, I am not gonna be able to get trapping for the last four days of the season that I thought I would. Just some work popped up and I'm gonna have to go out and collect all my tripped off traps. And hey, it was a pretty fun season definitely learn the most I did in any year of trapping. Uh, I do have about six cameras out there, so I will put up some video here of what those caught while I was away on vacation. And guess what? I finally did go have a nice talk with my first trapping teacher ever. He's 98 years old now and a wealth of knowledge, John Lobotsky. So let's go over to his house and uh, we'll have a little talk with John.
Hey, Trapper Dan here. I'm with my buddy, John Labotsky. Um, I think John is probably one of the oldest trappers in North America. <laughs> and just a little bit of a backstory, John and I are in the same club together. And about eight, 10 years ago, he stood up and he said, if anybody wants to learn about trapping, you know, just give me a call or come see me. So I think it was 2017 or 18, I drove into his driveway had never really formally met him and said, hey, I want to learn trapping. And this guy had this huge smile on his face and he says, let's do it. And that's the name of his committee at the club too. Just do it. So, uh, yeah. Tell, how old are you now, John? 98. 98 years old. And you know, you were trapping with me just like five years ago. You were checking the traps with yeah. your truck. Yeah. So how did you, when did you start trapping? Oh God. Probably in grade school. I gotta tell you about when I was a senior in high school, I, I caught 13 foxes and they put it in a local paper. And the local fox hunters got a petition out and sent it to Albany to try to stop me from trapping because they wanted a fox hunt. Oh, but there was an official season for trapping fox. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't want, they want to be just hunters, not trapping. So when the conservation department heard about me, they said, we want to hire you. He must be pretty good. So the New York Department of Conservation found out that you were a teenage trapper yeah. and you were pretty good and they said, we want to hire you? Yeah. yeah. Why did they do that? They had rabies problem all over the state. They had a bad outbreak in Connecticut along Route 22 and they said what we want you to do is take the whole Route 22 and try to prevent the foxes from coming in from Connecticut where they have a bad rabies outbreak. Oh, so they wanted to do some and, control trapping to get the population down so rabies didn't spread. Right, so uh, that was my first job. I, I went I think 40 miles before he was set a trap. I trapped all along uh, the whole route, and in 20 days, I took 120 foxes. In 20 days, 120 foxes. And did you? And they did they pay you by the hour, or you were like on a, on a salary, or how did that work? Well, you know, I, I was surprised that the conservation department had more power than a fisherman. Oh yeah, you could just go wherever I you just, wanted. I huh? just couldn't believe it. Nobody could say no to me. But of all the places I asked, nobody ever said no. Yeah. And that's all what I was doing. Yeah. And, uh, and so that, that's, they were sending all around five counties, you know, you know Green County, and Ulster, Columbia, uh, Duchess, Putnam. Wow, that's a big range. Any place they had rabies. Oh, okay, they sent you in. They sent me in. And this may sound like a cool thing, but it actually was good for the animals. Because what happened, the foxes, they are normal litters, three to five. And when he trapped them, they went five to eight. Uh, they instantly brought back the population. Right. What, what went down. Because they felt the pressure, but they brought back a healthy population. Right. And, and a smarter one. And a smarter one. Yeah. Yeah. One of the good boys. And, uh, and this, uh, so I let me ask another question. You got paid, but then did you also get to harvest fur too? Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. I, I had uh, well, there's, there's some pictures up there. I'm about to tell them. Oh, I'll take a picture of those. I trapped uh, when they were a dollar piece. I trapped when they were a hundred dollar piece. Wow, that's a big range. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're talking about. Uh, 70 years ago, right? Yeah. 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 Um, what other things did you trap back then? Well, I actually brought the beaver into this area with Ted Bonnery. A lot of people probably remember him. Oh, so you, you relocated <laughs> beaver here with another we guy? Brought him, we brought him in. I trapped him around Mill Book and out areas and brought. We brought like 15, 20 beaver here. And that's when the beaver population was really low. It wasn't any here. There wasn't any at all, no. right? 
when we start letting them loose, uh, we'll always come right back to the and Ryan picks it up, sparks, fine plays. And, and it should take long before we got a pretty good population. Wow, yeah, they're and, they're resilient yeah, once they now, get in now, there. Now they're actually up there. <laughs> you got the, yeah. you know, a beaver is a dumb animal first, but once he gets wise, he's one of the smartest animals out there. Yeah. I'm finding that out this season because last year I trapped in about five different locations and I got in there and I really got to figure them out and I got about 17 beaver and this year I'm just in two spots and both those spots they seem educated and I, I only got one. Did you trap the other year? Yes. I trapped them last year and uh, I'm not sure if someone else, one of the locations, someone else might have been in there before me. That's all you needed somewhere. That makes it a cool set or something like that. Even a little stick of the way a smart beaver will know it. Yeah, they know that. to force them into a trap. Mm -hmm. And they remember it. Yeah. I think I snapped a 750 on a belly last week. Oh, and, boy. And, oh that, boy. and once that happens. You won't catch them. Yeah, they know. I mean, anything out of the way, a stick or a branch or something, they'll avoid the place. Yeah. And they remember it. Now, back on the uh, DEC work that you did, you told me that you had some sort of state record with the amount of fox that you caught in one season. Oh, yeah, yeah. I took uh, 320. 320 fox in one yeah, season. Yeah. Wow. Well, was, uh, and you and you handled all that fur at your at, in your basement at your home or your garage? Or <laughs> yeah, right, right. My shelter and stuff, I just get them all out. And uh, it was a good job, you know. I, uh, I worked three jobs most of the time. Worked with conservation department. Was one uh, reestablishing the American chestnut was another one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had different things. Like I, worked, I ran a bulldozer. I, I did I had a sawmill. I did some other things. So, uh, well, I've known you to be a really diversified fella. You you figure out interesting things to do and how to make them successful, no matter if it's growing flowers or uh, yeah. catching fur. Yeah. You, you know? know, I've been you know I've been in the greenhouse business and landscaping, and I did a lot through a lot of Texas County and other counties through in landscaping and stuff. Let me let me ask you about coyotes. Were they were they here when no. you started trapping? There weren't any coyotes. I had my son trapping with me, mm -hmm. and he had a coyote when he thought he had a dog. He tried to lift the damn thing out of the trap, and he finally got me. And I said, well, Wait a, a minute, dog. that's not a domestic coyote. dog, yeah. The coyote we saw. Do you recall like when that was? Yeah, God, no, How old was your son? Well, he might have been a teenager. Oh yeah, and yeah. he's probably in his yeah. 60s now, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that was a long time ago. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, and then the, I didn't find them any more difficult to trap than a fox. Uh, in fact, I, I almost thought they were, were dumber. Mm -hmm. but, uh, now they've smartened up, though, <laughs> over the years. Now? I think so. I think they're very nervous. Well, uh, yeah, there's a, especially if they, you know, if they're trapped and didn't get caught. Yeah, then they, then they last, go. Time, last year I trapped, I only had one trap upset without it. Yeah, and you told me, so John told me a trick about this. He's always told me to do this. I've never been able to do it, but he said that he cut his pan sizes down smaller. Yeah, right. And that, that was your trick to not missing anything. Yeah, well, when I use a small trap, or most of the time I use it one and three quarter. I found them better than the number two because the number two they would pop the jaws. Uh -huh. But I, you can use the number two if you if you bend the or the jaws are fast and you bend them up so, so they will pop. Yeah. But I used one and three quarters and it had the strength, but also you had to make sure they put the damn foot in there not get caught by two toes. Yeah. So you had to cut the pan size down. So that and, that whole foot got in there. And then I had it go off in one bite. I would, I would not, I would not just go to the pen, 
a quarter inch from the bar. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, I actually had to pay them down and bring it down. Yeah. And then on the we he fastened it. Yeah. Where the dog? He had he had put that on an angle. Uh huh. And, and the trigger actually would go up a little bit on the end. Yeah. And it would go up in a bag when it went. It wasn't that good to it at all. Yeah, okay. It was, it was only instantly. So that, so it, it, it fired tight, really quick. It was tightened. Mm. So he would step on it. Yeah. You still had enough tension at like yeah. two or three pounds. Yeah, I, yeah, at least two pounds. And it also made you, you avoid a lot of uh, stuff like possums and skunks. Yeah, you try to trip it. target your, your yeah. animals, your, yeah. your bigger animals. So you also you also trapped in different states, right? You trapped out oh, in yeah. Kansas, yep. and up in uh, up in the Adirondacks. Adirondacks, yes, that was interesting. What were some of the names of the guys? I know you said you trapped with some famous trappers. Well, uh, butcher. Butcher. Uh, I don't remember that name right here. I don't know, but maybe some of our viewers was, do. Really I trapped with him, and uh, uh, Daly. Daly. Uh -huh. He was up in Adirondacks, up in the cat, up in the St. Lawrence. And, uh, I know there's a guy, Johnny Thorpe, I think was his name, was a pretty famous Adirondack trapper. Might have been even, might have been even after your time up there. Uh, who's that? Johnny Thorpe. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh sure, I know Johnny. Yeah, he was. Uh, I, I, I trap a lot of those guys for like a month or something. I just go and. Uh, they would learn from me and uh, I remember So even uh, back then you guys learned from each other, that's oh good. Yeah. It's, uh, nobody's told much to, about how to trap. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, you gotta, you gotta try out by yourself. And uh, the last year I said I went on one trap upset. Wow. Catch wow, you got it really dialed in. Yeah, so they didn't get smart. Yeah. You because don't want to catch my two toes and get out, you want the whole damn ten. Yeah. And one and three quarters of the hole and it gets more than three toes. And uh, sometimes you'll go to bigger traps or, or, and just eat either you know, with the twos or, or bigger, but by cutting the pan size down. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and when it, when it comes to uh, conner bear traps, you told me you're not into the 330, you like the 220. Yeah. Why, why is that? That, I got used to using the 220 and that was it, you know, I didn't, I didn't care, it was too, too big ones. Uh-huh. I didn't want to, but you, you don't want to catch dogs and things like that. Oh, this is because back then you could set them above ground. Uh, Nowadays yeah. you can't. Yeah. Everything has to be underwater. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, above ground is dangerous. Yeah. It's a lethal trap, yeah, so. Yeah, I said, uh, it was an interesting sport, and it still is. Uh, yeah, you get a, he gets a lifetime subscription to uh, oh God. trapping magazines. Oh, and, God, yeah. you're getting that for 40, 50 years. They're yeah. losing money on me on that one. He gives me all his uh, old subs uh, issues to, to read. I went over, well, the, the main center was pretty close to where Adam did in Poughkeepsie. Uh -huh. It was right close to him. Uh, only a couple of buildings away, and I, I, I also, you know, showed Adam a lot of things that I did, not in trapping, but in, in getting on Christmas trees. Uh -huh. I used to go out with a fellow from Poughkeepsie, his name was Sam Anna, who was down there at the railroad station. We would go up every year, go on the local uh, pin mill, did anybody want to work there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're gonna pay seventy five cents an hour. He said, "Oh, well, I'll be a pay so much." <laughs> seventy five uh, cents an hour. <laughs> I I even got uh, I did that here. Also, when I actually, I actually got three school teachers coming, in. Said, wow, seventy five cents, man. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a lot. I remember you told me because John's been in the Christmas tree business too, and they used to sell Christmas trees for one dollar, right? Yeah. One dollar so Christmas tree. We bought them for tree. twenty-five cents up there. Oh, you bought them for twenty-five cents and sold them for a dollar. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, uh, and, it, and maybe we had 
sixty cents at them by the time we finished. Yeah. And you we got sold to a lot of fire companies all around the Gibbs Street and Hyde Park and all the kind of all the fire companies had them. And they sold them for a buck and a half. Yeah, so they made a little bit. You know, the other thing you were telling me, talking about sort of the economy, is that when you went raccoon trapping, you used to be able to sell all the carcasses to oh, yeah. oh, as for food, right? Oh, yeah. You, what, someone came and just bought them from you? Yeah, they, they came out of New York City. And they got a regular loop with all the carcasses down there. They got really? good money for them. Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> Is that anything going on now? I don't think so. I don't think people eat raccoons. They'll come up once a week. You would freeze them and then they would come yeah. up and just yeah. uh, pick them up and put them in a cooler? And, 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 and they got good money for them. When I found out how much they got and how much they were paying us, you know, we got a couple of dollars for them and they, they would tell them for $8, $10. Wow. You know, they were making pretty good money on them. And you also, you told me when you sold your furs, well, tell us about how you sold your furs. After you were done with your season and you had everything put up, how did you sell? Did someone come and buy from you, or did you? Oh you yeah, have... well we had a lot of local buyers, and they would they would come around. But most of them went down to New York City, where uh, they had big buyers. They got none there to, to, that would buy. So what John said is he would go down to New York City, where they had big buyers <coughs> that he believes there isn't any there today. Uh, but that was like in a, a fur district or something? Yeah, there yeah, was quite a few of them around, and, and I had a, one of the biggest ones that I sold to. And uh, they would buy everything, pay a pretty good price. And uh, I got to know they owned it pretty good, and, and we had a good rapport. And, wow, so and, would they tell you, like, before the season started, would they, oh, would yeah. you talk to them and say, you know, <laughs> yeah, what, what yeah. were they looking for? Oh, sure. Yeah, they say, you know, if they want raccoons and they want to, uh, you know, different kind of animals they wanted. And they started specializing now because boxes were my thing. Yeah. And, uh, it was, uh, the fur market was certainly a lot different back then. Uh, yeah, it's a, actually, we don't have a lot of fur buyers around. I was, uh, um, I was basically planning to sell my furs to uh, the Groenwald company that they come by with a truck on two days a year and just buy everything. But also I just heard from a friend Chappie over in uh, Ulster County that he's going to be buying some furs, so I'm probably going to sell some yeah. to him. Um, you know, I, I want to also talk about the, the first set that John ever taught me is what he calls the rock set. Do you want to tell us about that? Oh, yeah. It's amazing that people still don't use it very much. I, I dig a hole, oh, sometimes eight, ten inches in diameter, maybe uh, eight, ten inches deep. And I fill it about halfway up with straw. And then I would put a uh, ground up thick in it. Just decayed a little bit, you know, a little slowly. Tainted fish, ground up fish. Okay. And then I put a great big flat rock on top of it. And on one side, <coughs> I would make it a little, little hole so they could make a smell from it. What's underneath it? And have that side cleaned off so you can make a set later on. And then you can make this even, God, even a month before traffic season. And you got the animals coming to them like crazy. They come every day and they're digging. Sometimes they get to the source where the food is. Once they eat, you can just fill the hole in a little bit or move the rock over. Yeah. And the rock will be big enough that they can't move it. Okay. So, and this, this, uh, boy, when, when, you, when you, you try to put the trap in there, I always use at least three sets. Three traps around that rock? You know, <coughs> one on the rock, then I make a regular dirt hole. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to post that. I make three sets, maybe 15, 20 feet away from each other. Yeah. And sometimes you got three boxes or whatever it is. Because they always run the evening couples together, and sometimes three together. And it was, uh, you might just as well, if you have a good spot, 
And there are good, really good spots sometimes for Clark and George show. Mm hmm. <coughs> on one field, maybe it's a gateway or something like that. Okay. And, uh, so. You want, you want, <coughs> you want the three sets. And, and it's just amazing how many extra boxes you catch. Wow. So let me wrap this up a little bit. So John's given us his secret to success here. <laughs> First of all, the, the set is called the rock set. It's one of his favorites where he makes a eight or 10 inch deep hole and he puts a little straw in the bottom to make sure that uh, the tainted fish sits on top of that straw and it doesn't go down in the bottom and freeze in a pool of water. So it's giving off aroma. And then he puts a big enough rock on top of that that an animal could not move. And then he digs a vent hole so the smell gets out. But this is a month before trapping season and it's just an attractor. Yeah. And they come in and they're digging at it and they're smelling at it and they get very comfortable around it. Then when trapping season opens, he puts a trap in there, basically kind of like a dirt hole set right in front of that yeah, vent. Yeah. And then, but you also said that you never just put one trap. You Then you work in that area and do a urine post set. And maybe if you had a hill where a fox would go up on top of, you'd do a, a set on that and you'd have three traps working, right? Yes, many times three animals. <coughs> <coughs> Amazing how good that works. Uh, that was one of the favorite. I also made water fish when water didn't freeze. Uh -huh. You have know, little, little streams back in the woods sometimes, and you got these little streams all over the place. And a uh, little saw on the top of the pan, and, and uh, you have to step on that to get to where you put your bait on another knob in the ground. And that worked when the ground was freezing and stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, I, I use, I use uh, oh, different ways to keep yeah. trap from freezing. I dry dirt with one of them, which only rained and snowed and stuff. And sometimes I would, I would mix that with some, some paraffin or something like that. And, and uh, you have it, you know, I'll maybe just use it. Uh, pay us a straw. Uh, you know, yeah, to keep it from freezing. Yeah, so John's yeah. talking about keeping the traps from freezing. He would use chaff from hay or straw <coughs> and uh, water sets, so where the water's not freezing and moving. And actually, he taught me this one, and he said, uh, take the little stream and out on a rock in the stream, put a piece of venison and cover it with a leaf or something, and then put a, uh, in between the bank and that, have a little piece of moss <laughs> that's like a stepping area yeah. and it's just between the bait and it's a, but that piece of moss is right on top of the trap pan. Yeah. And sure in one night I caught a raccoon and one night, the first night that yeah. I set that, that was yeah. the first animal yeah. I ever caught. Yeah, it's, it's a good set to, to use when you have a lot of bad weather. Yeah. Now you can't, uh, but uh, I also, in bad weather, I would make sets against a tree where it had a lot of trees and stuff where the snow was a little, maybe in the cliff in the back of it or something like that. And, and then, you know, or a big pine tree over top of it. So and, some uh, sort of shelter. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and then uh, sometimes I, I put a, a box darker up in the tree of a trap. Oh. You tie it up there and, and then I make the set down below. And that just brings the aroma of... Yeah, yeah. And you can make a little ewer and post that or something like that down below. Yeah. And, uh, and that works because uh, you have protection from the pine tree and mm -hmm. uh, from the branches and stuff. It, 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 the snow is bad and stuff like that. And you, yeah. And it was a little easier to trap. Because uh, Walt Arnold was a great trapper up in town and, and New England. What's his name? Walt Arnold? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he made cubby sets for him. Uh huh. Cubby sets for fox? Yeah. Huh. yeah I ended up catching a lot of fox and cubbies this year. <coughs> yeah. They were set for bobcats, but I kept catching yeah. fox. Oh, yeah. yeah no, no, no. That, that's all he used was cubby sets. And he did great, great with them. And then, so it helps in, in protection against bad weather. 
-hmm. That's the way he set him. He made a tree where he wouldn't get the snow deep and stuff like that. And, and, uh, and you get your block caps, you get your other animals in too. Yeah. The cubby sets will be used, especially in bad weather. And, but it's like Walt Arl used it all year around, and he, got, he did great with them. Now, you, were you also involved with the State Trapping Association? Or oh, yeah. yeah. What, what did you do? Yeah, well, I went around and I did demonstrations at meetings. Oh, okay. And uh, state meetings, and that was always a lot of fun. And sort of, sort of the way I did things. And, and, uh, it was interesting because a lot of the people, there wasn't much education back then. Mm -hmm. You know, and dying and stuff like that. And, uh, I used uh, uh, native stuff a lot of time, like sumac berries and stuff like that to dye the trap. Sumac berries and uh, black walnuts. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then uh, wax it with beeswax, uh, things like that. We didn't, we didn't have the thing you have today. Yeah. All the, I think you worked harder at it. I mean, you, you nowadays oh, yeah. we can just go to the trapping convention and buy dye in a bag, and, yeah, right. you know? Oh, yeah. Um, and also, you did what you were talking about earlier is a lot of trap modification, which nowadays a lot of traps already have a lot of those yeah. modifications. Oh, yeah. 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 I don't know if they have it down low like I, like I did to the unit. Maybe not. I mean, I know, you know, the new traps, you know, the pan is pretty flat right out of the box. Yeah, so getting the pan down and cutting it down and going off with a bang. Yeah, really. You got to put weight on it for it to the it. It yeah. a lot of difference. Yeah. You don't get two, two, two cut uh, toes in. You can yeah. Put it. yeah. That's, that's the important that's part. That's why I didn't lose very many. And, uh, it was an interesting sport. And, uh, I, I, I think I told you, I, I could do all three in one year. I worked for a powder shop and, and made mostly parts for IBM. Yeah, John has told me he actually helped develop the, if you anybody remembers the ball that was in an IBM typewriter that had the letters on it that would move, uh, yeah. he actually created that out of out of wood, yeah, right? It, it took one year. Well, I worked on that damn thing, I'll tell you. It, it, it was round, and so it made it very hard to cast on a metal. Uh huh. you couldn't pull all the metal to the ground. So I had to do it in pieces. And wow. I had like, like four or five pieces. So, they, so you could draw it out and still cast it. And it, it had to be carved out of wood. Yeah. And you make a mistake, you got to start over again because it cuts the wood. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, God, that was right when that was beginning. It was, it was a very frustrating After thing. the arm typewriters that, you know, yeah. moved to the ball typewriter and yeah. you helped <coughs> them. That's you know, amazing. I had that job that would always open to me. And uh, so I had, I had like three jobs that would always open, conservation apartment. And, and uh, they would, they would, I could leave them and, and they always wanted me to come back. Yeah. So I have two jobs that can work every year just say, hey, I'm going to see you in three months. <laughs> you, uh, well, first of all, you're a friendly guy. You have a knack for succeeding at things. John looks at things, I guess, kind of like an entrepreneur. You know, you look at things a little bit different and you try to figure out how to do them, but you also, you inherently enjoy everything you do. Like, oh, yeah. you don't, if you don't enjoy it, you're not doing it. You know, so yeah. you enjoyed trapping and growing yeah. flowers and... Yeah, well I had uh, seven greenhouses at one time. Seven greenhouses? Yeah. You know, uh, we go through Rhinebeck on the East Market Street, all those big trees you see growing there. I planted. Yeah, wow. They're locust trees. Why do I plant locust trees? Because I had to figure it. It's the only thing that's going to live there. Oh. There, was no, there was no space much around it if you, if you stop and look at it. Mm -hmm. The tree was almost as big as a hole. And I can't get much water. You got to have a tree to live. And this tree is still alive. I didn't lose a one of them. And it's getting kind of big now. There's almost no space at all left around. The whole space is taken with the tree. And I, I planted hundreds of trees in Rhinebeck. Wow. And, uh, I used to do uh, 
right after the war, did a lot of landscaping in Hyde Park with Golden, who was a famous builder down there. He just died last year, a good friend of mine. And uh, Bruce Joe and Cable Wilson, three contractors. They were building houses like crazy. And uh, I was buying sod, laying sod down, laying a couple of shrubs on the house, a couple of trees, gone. But one after the other, their houses were going up and I was landscaping them. And, uh, yeah, and I, I, I did a lot across the river too. I would do one say, in Sargonese, and all of a sudden I got five or six in Sargonese right around him. And <laughs> he kept us real busy. Uh, I like to help as many people as I can. Yeah. And the different tricks I learned with, with, with even with hunting. And, uh, well, John's, he's, like we said earlier, he's 98 years old, but he figures out how to still be active and uh, help people with things. He's also really big into uh, conservation with the American chestnut tree. Do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Now this year we got, we stymied, we was all set to go and the chestnuts got mixed up and it couldn't stop, uh, the series of nuts, so we lost a year. So uh, next year we'll be back, I'm, I'm promised one nut, this virus tree. My, my, uh, well, my name is Alan, up in uh, Ithaca College, he had a little right. plantation of them, and uh, everybody wants one nut or more from him, and uh, he, he only can, well, he'll pick maybe 70, 80 nuts. So and what is it, first of all, the American chestnut tree got some sort of blight, right? It got a blight from, from Japan. From Japan, and, and then it just it wiped them out. The Japanese chestnut over and it wiped them out. I can remember when I was young, if you remember that far back, we had chestnut trees that were Six, eight, ten foot in diameter. Wow, ten foot diameter trees. They did not rot. Yeah. <laughs> all the old barns. Well, all the old barns we see around today, most of them are made of chestnut. Yes, wood. yes, because they didn't rot. And, uh, and you told me something cool. You can tell our viewers um, how how. What about the traveling of a squirrel from New England to uh, yeah. Georgia? Yeah, it never hit the ground. Never hit the ground. <laughs> so one chestnut to the other. That's something you know, it's going to be hard to bring this back like they're trying to do. Yeah. Because we have so many uh, oddball chestnuts now, the tiny chestnut, and they have the tiny chestnut. And, and uh, one of the jobs they wanted me to do, they wanted me to do things in 20 counties. <laughs> and my agent said, no. Yeah. And buy 10 pieces in 20 counties. I said, well, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they wanted John to take over uh, 20 counties to be a representative yeah. for the American Chestnut Association. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. And uh, anyways, they're trying to spread the American chestnut tree that is uh, blight resistant, virus resistant. Yeah, well, Syracuse University is taking it over. Okay. They're, I'm working with them. And uh, they will actually make a plantation on every county in New York City. Oh wow. Great. So every county for free they'll start a plantation yep. so we start and, and getting the state. Them. For three years, four years they will protect them and then they, they start harvesting nuts. I really don't know how long they, they, they harvest the nuts for us to provide more nuts free to plant and, and then they turn over to the owner. And so they're, they're, it's a good program. It's going to take years and years to get going. I think we're all should be um, happy that someone like you that knows that you're not going to see the result of your hard work, but you know that it matters and you're just working as hard as you can even into your yeah. older days here. And I've got good men in, in the five counties right now that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. They all have uh, trees planted that are not virus free, but they're ready to cut them off and they grab yeah. That's what we're going to do the first thing. Do they call you Johnny Chestnut or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was, that was, uh, so uh, John is not only a legend in trapping and chestnut trees, but he's also a dowser. 
So he finds water for people. Um, he, he has a specific talent to uh, find water. That's, that's uh, I'm working, at, uh, I'm still working on Dalvey. And uh, it's, it's interesting work. I, when I first started doing it, if I found water for you, say you couldn't drink it or something like that. And I put fresh water in your tea well and eliminated the other water. I charged a hundred dollars if it works. And it always works. And nobody ever asked for a hundred dollars back with guarantee. Wow. And so that's uh now did you use a dowsing branch or you well, use I copper use, pipes? I, I, I use uh, a, a branch. Now I now I use dowsing rods. Dowsing rods, oh yeah, they're right next to you there. I okay, I'm, I'm looking for water. I mean when when they go parallel they come water. Wow. Okay. That's the water out there. Must parallel. be right over there. <laughs> okay. How far, far, how far away is this water? Is it uh, 20 feet? 30 feet? 100 feet? 100 feet away. Uh -huh. Okay. How many gallons a minute is it? Is it uh, one gallon? Two gallons? How many gallons a minute? Three gallons? Four gallons? Four gallons a minute. Which which way does this water flow? Does it flow north? <coughs> does it flow east? Oh boy. I didn't expect that. It flows east. Is it potable water? Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. Right away. Does anybody else use it? Yep, it looks like it. Can I move it if I have to? All, all this is yes when it goes this way. Yeah. When it goes this, when it goes this way, it's no. So, it's, uh, That's like magic. <laughs> yeah, well... It's, well, I'm glad that I could stop by and yeah, talk to you I, finally. I tell you, I'm glad you stopped. Yeah, thanks for, uh, <coughs> thanks for the talk and for uh, helping me as a beginning trapper, but also for uh, sharing your knowledge with the Trapline yeah. Talk folks. <laughs> Thanks for coming yeah. and talking well, to Well, it's been great to, you know, have you as a friend, so. Yeah. I wish I could visit more, but at least I can give you a call and tell you about what's going on. Yeah, I just, I'll get up to your restaurant here and I'll give a coffee yeah. and coffee and donut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no donuts at my place, but. <laughs> no donuts, okay. No, we have muffins and salads and sandwiches and soups. I thought you said you had a donut shop. No, they opened a new donut shop in Red Hook that's, oh, that, that's oh. packed right now, but not my place. Oh, okay, okay. That's okay. So, All right. Yeah, thanks for Thank, Yeah, thanks. Hey, everybody. I just got done editing that video of John Lobotsky, and I just wanted to say, if you got to this point, thanks for watching. I know it was a long talk, but, um, you know, you don't get to talk to someone like that often and it's just a piece of history he's a piece of history and he's a good friend and a good guy so also i want to say that i found two pamphlets that john wrote about trapping uh with those pictures that he showed me so he wanted to share those so i took pictures snapshots of each page of those pamphlets and they're going to come up here next in this video way too fast for you to read so you just stop it and read it if you'd like to. Um, I'm pretty sure these are the last copies of this and uh, John said, geez, I can't even remember what I wrote in there. <laughs> um, but now it's gonna be preserved on YouTube uh, forever, I guess, so. And guess what? I went to the fur truck, met Groenwalds in Kingston, New York, and a couple other great trappers too. So the next trap line talk is gonna be all about selling furs at the fur truck. I hope you can come back and watch that. And remember, Trapper Snore, sustainable, natural, organic, and renewable resource. He was a man.